Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stanley Brown, the Dean of the Dalalana School of Public Health. We start with the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. who are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And welcome tonight, or this afternoon, to the third annual Vora Miller Lectures in Critical Public Health Issues, in collaboration with the Institute for Pandemics here at the Dalalana School of Public Health. The Institute of Pandemics, along with its lead donors, the Vora Miller Foundation, sponsor this lecture series that features scholars, policymakers, advocates, all engaged in the science of pandemic-related health inequities and other critical public health issues, and actually how we translate that science so that it has impact. The Institute of Pandemics was formed to tackle some of the most pressing issues associated with the COVID-19 pandemic and understand how to prevent and cope better with future pandemics. This afternoon's discussion, media messaging on equity, will feature a panel of experts and their varied perspectives as they examine our media's handling of equity issues, including health equity during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. The biggest question, of course, is how do we do this differently? And it's important that we actually start to think about this. The pandemic showed that information is a key determinant of health. Like all determinants of health, its absence or an equity in access can be fatal. As the world changes, as social media becomes more important, the importance of information will only increase as a prime determinant of health. Our panelists today are gonna to have the opportunity to deeply assess and discuss the media environment from their lenses and perspectives, and experiences and thoughts about how we feel equity was covered and where we could actually implement change. Today's lecture will be a panel discussion be moderated by Professor Arjuman Siddiqui, who is our Canada Research Chair in Population Health Equity, one of our professors here at the Dalalana School of Public Health. My thanks to Arjuman, to all of our panelists for sharing the perspectives and for supporting and participating in the discussions like this. And they're important to the school, but I believe they're also important to our public health system. Your participation and contribution is key to making sure that not only do we develop new information and insights, but we also get them out there. Before I turn things over to Professor Siddiqui, I'd like to turn over to Sabina Vora Miller, lead donor for the Institute of Pandemics, both as you know, say my gratitude and thanks to her, uh, but also help us uh, with a few words before we get started. Thank you. As we head into year three of the COVID pandemic, we are all well aware that specific communities paid the highest price during the pandemic and are continuing to pay this price as the world moves on. Any initiative addressing the pandemic must, in fact, first and foremost, consider the inequitable impacts of this pandemic, especially as we pave our way to recovery and focus on building resilient and thriving communities. Public health is rooted in social justice, which we know is fundamental to address health inequities. It is with this understanding that the Vorher Miller Family Foundation partnered with the Dalalana School of Public Health to launch the Institute for Pandemics in 2020, built very much on the foundation of equity, social responsibility, and intersectionality. One of our most revered aspects of this partnership was the birth of this annual lecture series on critical public health issues. Each year, we try and tackle a topic that is not just pertinent to public health, but specifically digs deep into the social injustices and inequities that perpetuate health disparities. The path to effective action is by working on the causes rather than the consequences of health inequities, which would not be possible, frankly, without having these critical, meaningful, and truthful conversations. In previous years, we've had profound dialogues on the structural context of inequities, the power within communities and advocacy, and today we hope to get deeper into another equally important conversation, which is the role and importance of media messaging on equity. I am so thrilled to have with us today four exceptional panelists whose work I deeply admire. Thank you to Professor Arjuman Siddiqui for hosting this session and to Dean Staney Brown for making this lecture series a possibility. I'm also grateful to all of you joining us today. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to this year's uh, lecture from the Pandemic Institute at the Dalalana School of Public Health. My gratitude and thanks to Staney and to Sabina Vora Miller uh, for their support for uh, in every way. And I, I must say that uh, I think I speak for many people when I say that uh, Sabina's involvement with the school has been uh, really quite, uh, has had quite an impact and we really appreciate uh, her very much. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about media uh, and media involvement in reporting on uh, equity issues with a focus on the COVID pandemic, but uh, also sort of reflecting on what the broader context of the media is in and its involvement has been over the last many, many years uh, in terms of helping us understand what the equity issues are in our society. And I think the goal today is really to think about what this messaging has looked like and why it has looked that way. And so the panelists that we brought together will be able to offer insights sort of on the level of the reporting, but also hopefully on the level of the structure and the system of the media that might give us some insights about what kind of reporting is happening and as Staney mentioned, how we can do better. Before I introduce them, I just want to uh, remind us that attendees today can ask questions through the Zoom Q&A function. And a few of those questions will be selected, not even by me. So I, I'm even in the dark about this. Um, and that's because we won't be able to get to everyone's questions. But some folks behind the scenes uh, will be able to help us with that uh, today. Also, this event will be recorded and posted on the DLSPH YouTube page with closed captions following the event. And so today's event will be structured initially as a discussion amongst the panelists, and then we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions from the audience. And the other thing I wanna do before I uh, introduce the panelists is just thank a few people without whom this event absolutely would not happen. Uh, and in particular, Vanessa Smith uh, and Afshan Kohari and their team have been just absolutely exceptional uh, over the last many months as we've uh, been planning and organizing this event. And today having uh, Claire Eno and David Kupis with us helping with logistics behind the scene is very much appreciated. So let me introduce to you uh, the panelists today. Uh, we have with us uh, Denise Baksun, who is the Ontario Bureau Chief at the Narwhal. She has also been Executive Director at Chatelaine and a columnist and editor at the Globe and Mail, where she co-hosted and co-produced Color Code, an award-winning broadcast about race in Canada. Next, we have Adia Roderick, who is an Assistant Professor of Journalism here uh, at the University of Toronto in the Department of Arts, Culture and Media. Uh, prior to joining the department, Hadia worked as a consultant, speaker, broadcaster, commentator, journalist, and lawyer. Uh, she is an award-winning journalist who most recently won, uh, most recently winning the National Magazine Award for Best Short Feature in 2021. And she has bylines in The Walrus, The National Post, McLean's, The Toronto Star, Chatelaine, Elle, The Local, and The Globe and Mail. We also have Tai Huin, who is editor-in-chief of The Local, an award-winning magazine exploring urban health and social issues in Toronto. He's also creative director at UHN Open Lab, a, des a design and innovation studio dedicated to a human-centered approach for advancing health and its determinants. Tai is also co-founder of Choosing Wisely Canada. Finally, uh, we have uh, Tai Obero, who is an award-winning journalist whose, whose distinguished track record includes legacy corporations such as CBC and The Guardian, where she is currently a regular columnist. Her work has also appeared in publications such as The Globe and Mail, Teen Vogue, Essence Magazine, Refinery29, Chatelaine, and The Walrus, among others. Uh, we are very, very lucky to have such an uh, esteemed and illustrious group with us. And I think more importantly, a group that has been working very, very hard on reporting uh, equity issues before the pandemic and, and during as well. Let's get started with perhaps um, an open question. I kind of want to set the scene for our audience and get your 
general perspectives, your opening kind of uh, inner thoughts about how equity is covered in the media, um, how it's been covered during the COVID-19 pandemic, and sort of any kind of um, key points and messages um, that occur to you, key kind of insights that occur to you about um, what the general landscape looks like for the media and reporting on equity. And maybe we'll start, uh, if you don't mind, with Denise. Sorry, I still haven't learned to unmute. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Arjuman. Um, so that's a big question. Uh, I would say I wanted to start off being a bit positive and saying that it's better than it used to be. You know, I've been a journalist for 20 years and I think, you know, the work that many people have done, including myself, it's nice to see it pay off in certain ways. Um, so I think that you know, we'll all have a lot of time to complain later, and I definitely will. Um, but I think that the work that people have done trying to make newsrooms more aware of equity, more inclusive, more diverse, has paid off in some ways um, with the pandemic specifically. I mean, I think Ty and the local did such great work. Um, and one of the reporters who's now at the Narwhal, Fatima Sayed, she wrote a really great story about workers in Peel region that won a World Press Freedom Award. Um, and I think it just shows what happens when you have a reporter who knows the subject with an editor that's willing to put some resources toward it. Um, some other people, I would say, you know, Jenny Yang and really the health team at the Star, I think, did a decent job. Um, Sarah Mojda Hizada at the Star did some really great labor coverage as well. Doc Shana, Baskar Murdy at the Globe did some really great work. And again, those are all people that have been at this for a long time and have been pushing to do equity reporting for a long time. And the pandemic was a chance to see that when you have people that know this topic, what they can do, you know, when, when you put them on it. And so that would be, I think, the pro side. Um, on the con side or the problematic side, um, I saw, you know, if we, it's sometimes hard to remember what March 2020 was like, but there really was this giant information vacuum and governments were not saying a lot. And there were experts that stepped up, you know, on social media to fill that gap. And in some ways it was really helpful and reassuring to have people who, you know, are epidemiologists, um, are good at stats sort of putting those numbers in. And um, I don't want to, you know, I was very grateful for it and I still am. Um, but a lot of those people were not interested in equity. And we could see as time went on that the, this basic understanding of epidemiology or numbers failed to really incorporate who was being most affected and who was most at risk. Um, and then you have the problem that journalism often has, which is you go back to the same experts because you know they're going to answer your call. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, I spoke to epidemiologists privately, like female epidemiologists, where they had more family responsibilities. You know, if they were academics, they felt that they were the ones dealing with their students and their mental health crises, which gave the men more space to like go onto CBC and CP24 and, you know, take up a lot of attention and not really talk about equity in that way. Um, so I think, yeah, the pro is that there are people that are working on this. And when they were given a chance to use their expertise, it turned out quite well. And the con is that, I guess, with health journalism or with the medical profession specifically, you know, you all have the same equity problems that we do, and the same people rush to fill the gap, and that often left equity sort of by the wayside for the sort of basic day-to-day -day CP24 kind of coverage that is probably what most people actually are exposed to. So that would be sort of my bird's eye view. That's really, really helpful. And I, I imagine much of what you said resonates a lot with the audience as it does uh, with me. Uh, because you implicated Ty, I'm going to go to Ty yeah. next. Yeah, I would totally agree with Denise. I think um, the situation is a lot better now than it was pre-pandemic as far as reporting on equity, especially health equity. In fact, the local was started in 2019 specifically uh, to try to address that issue. Um, the social determinants of health, I think, and equity, health equity has always been this kind of 
topic that's discussed heavily in academia, but has a hard time penetrating um, to uh, ordinary individuals and society more broadly. And so we were very interested in 2019 to really talk about that. And it was still very difficult to talk about, even though we expended quite a amount of resources in doing long form stories, using data, et cetera, as, you know, talking about equity as and, and the social determinants as this kind of very slow moving glacial kind of um, phenomenon that, that eventually um, divides society. And then the pandemic hit in March 2020 and kind of put all of that on steroids, really. So we saw disparities, you know, take place overnight, like week to week. We saw that with the vaccine rollout, right? Areas that are very wealthy, that are um, mostly white, getting vaccinated at in, like rapid, like very rapid pace compared to, let's say, in Scarborough or Toronto's Northwest or in Peel region, as uh, as uh, Fatima reported, and, and thanks Denise for bringing that up. So I think the media kind of caught on to it, the mainstream media, because it was just you know, happening so quickly and it could be almost felt on a week to week basis. And I think, um, you know, it's a good thing that we're all now uh, much more aware and can cover these issues. I think the, the, the concern for me is like, will coverage continue, I guess, post pandemic, as some of these more acute issues go away. And, you know, the other thing that is probably worth bringing into this is, while all of this is happening in health and in public health, we also had George Floyd and Black Lives Matter happening at the same time, right? And so I think it really brought a lot of attention to, um, you know, specific populations or subpopulations uh, within the city that you know were um, were uh, falling behind as far as um, you know the pandemic response went. So yeah, I think um, overall I'm really encouraged, but time will tell uh, in terms of you know how this will last um, post pandemic. It's terrific, thanks, Ty. Uh, Tayo, maybe I'll ask you to chime in next. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to be a little bit uh, negative because I my personal experience was a little bit um, um, difficult. I'll be honest because I and you know I'm really glad to have uh, Denise and Ty kind of be able to give the bird's eye view just from like an like an editor's perspective. Um, and I was kind of more um, like in the position of a reporter, and some of the reporting that I did was for the local. So I did work with um, Ty a little bit during this process as well. And like Ty, you'll remember this one of the biggest issues that we kept on coming up against was just this lack of data. So we knew all of this information that we had anecdotally about the ways that the pandemic was impacting specific communities. Um, and for me, like my purview specifically was more racialized communities and the black community specifically, especially in the city of Toronto. And there just was no information anywhere. So it was like we, we got hit with the pandemic and then getting kind of, you know, um, having that happen in March of 2020 kind of all of a sudden meant that, you know, both the health systems and the media just wasn't prepared to take on the task of like being able to deal with this um, health pandemic, but also being able to report on it and get out accurate information, um, both on time, but as widely as possible. Um, and so a lot of that just came back to a complete lack of data. Um, but also, it also showed a lot of other issues within the reporting side of things. So, um, you know, as Denise mentioned, experts, like who gets to actually have these conversations or who gets to lead the conversations about what's happening during the pandemic. And in a lot of cases, it wasn't racialized people or it wasn't the people People from the communities who were most affected by this, who were kind of taking the lead on the messaging about what was happening during the pandemic. Um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into a, a little bit of what the effect of that was later on. But um, yeah, it was, it was a, a difficult moment from, you know, just the reporting standpoint, as far as just being able to get like facts and figures and data that could legitimize all of the anecdotal stuff that we knew was true, but that you can't really say unless you have the numbers to back it up, right? So that was, I think, the biggest um, difficulty for me. But it was encouraging to, to see that the conversation 
is now happening and and that's been as a result of like this moment that we've been in in the pandemic um it just sucks that we kind of had to figure it out while we were in crisis absolutely and i i should say as someone who was interviewed by denise uh during the pandemic i appreciate uh, that she made that effort to reach out uh to the uh, non-standard folks doing equity work um thank you tayo uh hadia yeah, so maybe I'll take the bird's eye, bird's eye view as the uh, academic on the panel. So coverage of racial and ethnic health disparities have been relatively relatively scarce, um, partially because of this lack of data. It's easier to report on statistical information that is generated by government agencies, but we don't have that accessible. People just aren't going to report. It's uh, it's harder to go into the community and find those diverse individual community specific stories on the effects of health disparities. And typically health disparities mostly impact people who are already marginalized by society and who are not regarded as people of value. And so their presence in the media um, tends to be lower. This changed during the pandemic. And so what my lab is doing is we are investigating how the media talks about health inequity pre-pandemic, so looking at 2017 to 2020, when the pandemic hit, and then post-pandemic. And so what we're finding is that when the pandemic hit, uh, we see a number of themes. So uh, increased importance of the collection of race-based data uh, being discussed. Anti-Black racism being framed as a public health crisis. So this new discourse of anti-Blackness as a health issue. Um, Another theme coming out is that the pandemic is revealing and amplifying, not creating these inequities. Um, another major theme is seeing the pandemic and anti-Black racism as sort of these twin crises, as, as uh, Ty alluded to. And then there was a focus on the tension or the dilemma between, you know, when we are under lockdown, abiding by public health guidelines, but also wanting to be out there on the streets protesting. And there was a a huge spike actually in the discussion of health inequity in the media. That has died down somewhat in 2021 and 2022. Um, we are still seeing some very interesting trends though, however, um, we're seeing more pieces written by BIPOC authors um, about health inequity, but these tend not to be people in the newsrooms. Um, these tend to be op-ed contributors, people from outside the newsrooms, often working in healthcare, um, maybe promoting the organizations or causes they, they work for. Um, we're seeing much more, many more calls for systemic action. So implementing race-based data collection, um, sort of rather than your neoliberal solutions of let's learn more about microaggressions or let's investigate personal biases. And we're seeing the racial health disparities kind of move back somewhat into the periphery. So they'll be mentioned alongside a lot of intersectional issues, um, but there are still a considerable number of stories in you know, 2021, 20, 2022 where it remains the major topic, but just less so than 2020. People are now discussing racial health disparities as a given, right. which did not used to happen before. So as a given that most severely affects Black, Indigenous, Hispanic, um, individuals with no additional reason or explanation sort of given beyond mentioned systemic racism, whereas before there was a lot more justification about the discussion. And now it feels like people feel like 2020 happened. And if you don't think racism exists anymore, then we're just not going to bother with you. It's kind of the sentiment in the reporting. And then the term social determinants of health has entered the public vocabulary in a much stronger way with less need to explain it anymore. Um, as you would have seen it a lot more in some of the pre-COVID articles. And then there's a lot more reflection on COVID-19 sort of as a turning point or an opportunity to reform healthcare more broadly. So those are some of the, the themes that we've been seeing in looking sort of at this six-year picture of health inequity reporting. And maybe I'll pause there. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. It's really, really innovative and necessary work. Right? It's a really innovative lens through which to look at these issues. I really appreciate that. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about a few themes that have just come out of your opening statements, actually. Um, one is the structure of the media complex and what kind of uh, reporting happens, by whom, and why? And I heard a couple of things come out today. 
One is uh, the issue of editorial support. The other is the issue of journalists who have knowledge in this area. And my general understanding is that specialist, um, specializations within journalism are sort of uh, a problem these days anyways, that, that a lot of journalists are, aren't assigned to sort of specialty areas. Um, I heard people talking about who the experts were uh, during the pandemic um, and who was sort of coming on uh, TV, et cetera. But also, you know, Tayo's point about, uh, uh, you know, what it meant for experts outside of journalism to be writing about these issues in media outlets as opposed to uh, true journalists. Um, and so I want to pick up a little bit on this issue of how the media is structured and what facilitates um, reporting, um, truthful, honest, hard, hard hitting reporting on what the equity issues are in society writ large and then um, specific to the pandemic era. And just hear your thoughts about what you think is happening structurally in the media, um, either change over time or just where we are right now that would support this reporting. And, and if you don't think that the structures support it, what would you say, either pie in the sky, ideal case, or uh, what you think in the immediate term could be done to sort of facilitate this kind of reporting and to facilitate honest messages and repeat messages about these issues uh, occurring in the media. Uh, and maybe Tayo, I'll start with you this time. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a oh, oh, sorry. Ty and Tayo. Ty and Tayo. Tayo, but either either of I'm going to you too, Ty. So <laughs> okay. I'll going to all of you. <laughs> okay. no yeah, Ty, do you want to jump in or I can I can start? Um, Go ahead, yeah, so Ty, okay. I, yeah, I think one of for me, like one of the biggest issues when you talk about just the actual structure of like media as an institution, one of the things that we've seen happen um, and it's been happening, you know, for over a decade now, but is the slow death of local journalism. And I think when we look back at the pandemic and, you know, media coverage of um, certain communities, whether it's, you know, ethnic communities or just like small local communities, like you really felt what was missing, right? You really felt like local journalism just wasn't there. And I think that's one of the things that has been, um, that has created this huge gap as far as just be having boots on the ground to know exactly what's going on, but also being able to kind of pick up, as Celia mentioned before, like those marginalized voices, voices who would have fallen by the wayside typically in any other crisis. Um, so a lot of the times, like local journalism is our only entry point to finding those voices, right? So I think one of the things that, again, the pandemic highlighted, um, you know, a bunch of different things that were broken about the media infrastructure, but I think one of the things that was really glaring as far as what we weren't seeing or what we didn't have access to during this time was the fact that just so many local newsrooms are now gone and there's no actual people on the ground to do this reporting. That's a really um, tragic but um, helpful insight, Ty. Yeah, I would agree with that. Also, I think I mean, at the local, we try to, because a lot of our reporting is hyper-local, right? Like very neighborhood specific and community specific. Um, we always try to ensure that we have journalists uh, who understand those communities or who are from those communities, because it opens up a lot of doors. It can also help, you know, tell the story with a lot more nuance than, you know, somebody just parachuting in, right? And so, I mean, Tayo, you did a story for us uh, about vaccinating Toronto's Black community, right? And it's a community that you know well, and, and I think, you know, that speaks to kind of the approach that we take, but it's very difficult in an industry where, um, you know, racialized folks are underemployed, uh, underrepresented. I think the Canadian Association for Journalists in their latest survey show that only, I think, 22% of journalists in Canada are racialized, right? And that's, you know, for Toronto, that's well below um, what, you know, the diversity is of the city. So I think it becomes really challenging when you look at the mix of uh, people who go into journalism and who, um, who rise to the ranks, you know, in journalism. So I, I think that is one of the challenges. I mean, we're trying to, 
do our best. Like the local is a tiny little publication, but you know we have a program um, to train. It's a fellowship program to train and recruit um, young journalists from you know communities that are underrepresented in media. But you know we're again a small shop. I think a lot more needs to be done uh, to kind of build that healthy um, ecosystem. But I think it's really critical. I think when you're trying to report on these, these issues uh, from these communities. I remember the very one of the very first uh, pop-up vaccine clinics happened at Jane and Finch, right? I was just there wondering, trying to figure out what they were doing. And I bumped into Yara Guzman, who had been um, a fellow with us. And he was wandering around with his camera, taking photos and, um, what I realized right then after talking to him for five minutes, he lives in that building at Jane and Finch where they were having this pop-up tent set up in a basketball court to, to do the vaccination. And right immediately, I knew he was the one that, that we needed to hire. And I hired him on the spot to do this story. And he did a photo essay about that vaccine clinic at Jane and Finch. And it's just you know wonderfully intimate because that's his community. He knows the people, right? He could get in there and and really tell that story with a lot of nuance and understanding and empathy. So I think, you know, those types of, um, that type of journalism is something that I love and I think we need more of. And as an industry, I think we just need more people, more diversity so that we can tell more of those stories. That's really, really great. Thai, um, a couple, well, it sounds, first of all, like you need the journalist and you need the ties of the world who are running the show, who can, you know, do the hiring and so on and the editing. Um, one other follow-up question, you mentioned um, the lack of diversity in, in journalism uh, in race, ethnic terms. Can you say a little bit more? Do you guys know in your field if this is both about how many um, um racialized people enter the field or try to enter the field versus labor market discrimination at the level of employment opportunities? Is it, I'm imagining it's both, but I wonder if you, you know much about that in the field. So is it that people are not becoming journalists and are being discriminated against once they try to get a job? Is it one more than the other? I think part of the issue is that we don't have that data. <laughs> um, I know there was a recent survey by I think the CAJ or the CBJ um, looking into the experience of racialized journalists, um, but it's very hard to collect that data because there are so few people that it's it's going to be very hard to cover up who someone is. You know, you know, on air reporter for a music show on the CBC would have outed Nanaba Duncan as, you know, as the person or um, Matt Galloway. So I think it can be really hard to collect some of that data. Um, and also the newsrooms are reluctant to uh, collect that data themselves and then share it publicly. I think the only place we have a chance of really doing that is a public broadcaster like the CBC because the government can sort of order them to do so. But um, harder to get uh, other publications to do so. Yeah, Denise. I mean, my personal opinion, which is anecdotal, is that it is not at the entry level, because if you go to journalism schools, it's full of, you know, all sorts of students. Um, I think that it's at the mid-career level. I think it's at age 30 when you need a staff job because you maybe want to take on other responsibilities in your personal life like permanent housing or a family or something um and you sort of slogged away and you're not getting a staff job and you need to make a decision about your life and your livelihood because um young people of so many different backgrounds is never difficult for me to find if I'm looking for an internship um, but when I get to the mid-career level, when I want to assign someone a 4,000 word feature, or we're looking for some sort of intermediate editor, it is often quite hard to find people with the experience because they've all sort of given up um, and probably because they've experienced discrimination in their careers personally. And it's very disheartening alongside not never making, you know, decent money. Um, 
And I think talking about COVID is, you know, the moment, like, to mention, like, it's it's just this microcosm, because yes, like, George Floyd was killed, and this massive, you know, Black Lives Matter movement happened, and that also reverberated in journalism, and I was one of a number of people that wrote about, you know, my experiences with race and Canadian journalism, and I was talking about my time at the Globe, um, and all the, so many people that wrote about that at that time were talking about jobs they had left, right? So I was talking about a job that I left, like Wab Kishag Rice, um, who is Anishinaabe, wrote about leaving the CBC. You know, so many people were talking about, like Kathleen Newman Bermang, who's at Refinery29, talked about leaving CTV. And in, you know, in the wake of that, all of these publications made a lot of promises. And I actually would really love to go back and see who has remotely fulfilled them. You know, I was at Shadowloon at the time and Maureen Halusha, who's the editor-in-chief there, is a very authentic person who actually does, you know, is committed. And so she, you know, made a commitment about how much of the freelance budget would go to racialized writers and is actually still to this month counting it up. But I don't know of any other publication that is doing it in that systemic way and the way that they promised two, three years ago. Um, and the reason I wanted to mention, you know, journalists who are working on this at the beginning is because it's a real cycle, you know, and people get burned out and they leave. And that allows these places to have another diversity committee that makes the same findings that the management promises to do. And that's a lip service promise. And then those journalists burn out at age 30 over and over again. Um, and so, yeah, my personal opinion is that it's a mid-career thing where people might get the seniority and the expertise to actually be making change when they're sort of forced out or burned out, out because of a lack of commitment to, you know, helping grow their career. Super helpful. Any follow-ups to that? Um, yeah, Just, I think, I, oh, sorry, Tyler. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just going to add to just a little bit to kind of the entry level side of things. And I, I, I agree. I think there's a it's it, it does get very discouraging. And I've seen um, a lot of people kind of get to that mid career point and just realize like this just doesn't work for them anymore. Um, but even coming into the industry, like I can speak, I've been on the uh, board for the Canadian Association of Black Journalists for a few years. And we do like a couple of programs for like getting into schools and like starting the conversation about seeing journalism as a viable career path earlier than, you know, whether it's university or, you know, trying to figure out what you're going to do with life after university. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about other um, industries, like, you know, the tech space or whatever, like there's, I can think of any number of like training programs or like coding camps for boys or like whatever, learn HTML for girls. Like all of those things are kind of built into the infrastructure of those industries so that it's it's a like it's a career path even before you know what a career is. Um, but those conversations aren't happening, I think, when it comes to journalism and media. Like it's just from our findings, and again, this is just my experience anecdotally um, through kind of you know seeing the back end of these programs. Journalism and media just isn't talked about um, as a career path you know, in the way that other um, industries are. And I think it also, again, goes back to the mid-career thing. Like if you already quit your job um, because you weren't getting paid enough, then you're not gonna encourage your nieces and nephews to take that path. Um, and I think the other thing too, is we talked a, a lot about um, just like internships and, and the nature of internships. And I think, again, in journalism, I think journalism has probably the most unpaid internships that I, like I've ever heard in any industry. Um, and that is a problem that we like continuously have talked about over the years. But again, just because of social realities, a lot of the times, and those internships are unpaid. So that's, that's what I mean by this is an issue, like this is all un unpaid internships. And again, because of social realities, a lot of the times racialized kids aren't the ones who can afford to take a year off to work for free. So again like that just it becomes like a limiting factor right away right so just basic like survival I think the industry is shrinking and it's difficult to make a decent living um, in this current economy as a journalist and I think the kind of purpose-driven um, work that fuels a lot of us like it, it just doesn't put food on the table and I think a lot of people are beginning to make that difficult choice. 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention there's an economist, Miles Korak, who's done work looking at um, super elites in Canadian society, usually white men. And his finding is that of uh, uh, sort of entry level people in very high level sort of companies and, and um, high level jobs, um, most of them interned at their father's mm. company. So it's that it's unpaid and it's also done through internal networks, which, which becomes self-reinforcing. So he said, it's not just that they interned somewhere large, it's that it was their actual dad's usually firm. So for what that's worth. Uh, Ty, you were going to say something a little earlier? Yeah, I was going to get into this whole uh, entry level and unpaid internship situation too. I think it is a it is a factor. It's something that's structural, endemic to the industry. It's been around for a while. Um, and now I think increasingly it's, it's frowned upon. Uh, you know, maybe that's an encouraging thing. I can remember which outlet it was last year that posted a, a job, an internship job, and said it was unpaid and it just got racial on social media. So maybe that's a good sign that, you know, people are catching on to this. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Um, so I think, you know, I wanted to set that context just to give people a sense of what you guys are dealing with in the industry in terms of uh, the lay of the land, who's uh, reporting these issues, how does that all happen? And I think you've done a really nice job of giving us a sense of those dynamics. So now I want to turn a little bit to the reporting itself. And um, maybe I will start with something else I heard you guys talk about a lot and that um, uh, I did some op-edding and so on about early in the uh, pandemic, and that is the data issue. Um, and in fact, there was a fair amount of reporting on the lack of data as well, which was really interesting. Uh, I remember one Globe and Mail piece that said it's embarrassing that we don't have this data. Um, so I, I want to talk about this from a few different perspectives. One is, again, sort of pre-pandemic. What was the demand for this data in the equity space? What were the kinds of equity issues that you were trying to get data on and were coming up empty or having a hard time um, um, sort of reporting on for that reason that, that the data weren't there? Um, and then into the pandemic season, um, how did this data issue sort of confront itself? How did you sort of manage it? Um, I can tell you again, so from our experience, we ran into the same issues. There was no data. We kind of, you know, joined a chorus of, vo of voices to uh, prompt that data to start to be collected. We do hope that this is the start of more routine data collection, although I think it's it's worth saying that it's not a universal uh, uh, thing to be sort of in favor of uh, uh, getting this data. And it's not always clear that um, everyone wants the data, though I think, you know, a lot of people do. And that actually brings me to another part of this question, this sort of rambling question, which is Hadia's point about, earlier point about not being able to get the local kind of insights, the, the sort of individual stories from communities as easily, because it's difficult to do. How many people are you going to uh, interview to get a sense of what's happening? As you guys have pointed out, there's fewer local reporters and so on. So if you could talk also, if it applies to you, a little bit about where the data sit in the broad scheme of what you might want to report on, um, on, on equity issues. So what is the value of data in reporting on equity and what are the substitutes and what is the meaning of not having that data? How does it sort of um, hamstring your ability to tell a story about what's happening? Um, and um, all of you have sort of touched on these issues, but maybe I'll, I'll go to Hadia first. I knew it. <laughs> um, so I actually just came back from a data journalism conference and I went to a number of sessions on, you know, 
how to use policing data, how to use crime data, how to use health data. And they would talk about these data sets that were available at the state or city or local level. And I would just, in each session, I was like, yep, we don't have that. Yep, no, we don't have that. Not relevant, not relevant. And it made me think that if I'm going to do some of this reporting, I can actually only do it in an American context and not in a Canadian context. And so it just, it really brought home to me that the U.S. puts a lot of that data out there at, for you to scrape and get and collect. And we just don't. And I think one of the things um, that is damaging is that it means that we have we collect, we write stories based on individuals and individual episodic framing. So focusing, it means that the stories we write focus on people's individual choices. Um, and it invites people to make internal attributions and place responsibility for societal problems on those who are most in need. And so blaming basically victims of social injustice for their own health outcomes, because we don't have the data that shows that, no, it's actually, you know, this societal you know, problem or element that is contributing to that health outcome. And so it means we see things like, you know, getting those feel good stories that are highlighted, um, you know, people celebrating frontline workers during the pandemic, or the, you know, we had the clapping and the banging of pots or um, focusing on, you know, that one person walking out of the hospital after months of treatment, which is great, but that does not really help us solve problems. For us to solve problems, we need to have stories that have um, thematic framing and hybrid framing. And what I mean by um, thematic framing is that that treats problems as consequences of larger systemic factors. And that allows us to invite external attributions of responsibility. And this kind of thematic framing and external attribution is associated with support for broader systemic policy changes. Um, such as, you know, federal relief programs or other things. Hybrid framing can combine kind of the two approaches. So combining this notion of individual responsibility with societal and structural causes tends to elicit actually more empathy from audiences. And so without that data, it makes it much harder for in us to engage in thematic and hybrid framing and to write the kinds of stories that will actually lead to change. Really helpful. Uh, Denise, uh, thoughts on the role of data in reporting on equity? Um, I think, you know, one of the greatest challenges for journalists is to try and convey to the Canadian public just how much information the government keeps from them. Um, so there's data, there's questions that go unanswered, there's access to information requests that take six years and cost $400. Um, and this is like our daily life. And I don't know that non-journalists or non-academics, because they also will talk about access to information, really understand um, how often you hit a brick wall trying to get your own information from your own government. Um, that's interesting that you said, Hadia, that it that like stories that weave in personal stories with data elicit better empathy. Um, that's good to know, because sometimes I get very frustrated. You know, we can say that the, the data situation is better in the United States, and it is, and also people return your calls better. Um, but I don't know that the outcomes are necessarily better, which doesn't mean I don't think we should have the information in Canada. But it's just like in Canada, we pretend that we don't have the problem. Like, we're just like, oh, well, we don't have that problem. Whereas in the States, like, they definitely know they have the problem, but then the interest in fixing the problem in both places is pretty much non-existent. And so um, I absolutely think we deserve better data and information from our governments. Um, but then I do think that there's a next step. It's like, okay, well, now that we have this proof, what does get, like, a response or a reaction after that? That's That's something that it kind of stumps me sometimes. Great, thanks, Ty. Yeah, I think, I don't think we'll ever have enough data. I think that's the truth of it. And um, I think we've learned to use whatever data that we have to triangulate, you know, the situation. So um, during the vaccine rollout, for example, 
I mean, actually, even before that, I mean, we produced a bunch of maps back in 2019, our very first issue at the local about called mapping our divisions and the map of wealth maps over the map of disease over the map of mortality, like perfectly, right? So the wealthy areas of the city of Toronto, for example, up and down the Young Street corridor, um, also happens to be immune to all kinds of diseases, including COVID-19. And we're the first to get vaccinated, right, in huge volumes. And um, and so during the pandemic, um, it wasn't very difficult when you look at the vaccine rollout data to know that, wait a minute, um, Jane and Finch or Mount Olive or, um, you know, any of those neighborhoods up in the Northwest that were slow to get pandemic response also happened to be 50% Black, right? Um, working as essential workers, uh, et cetera. So all of these things pile up and they kind of help shape your understanding of the situation that racialized folks were um, being disproportionately impacted by this pandemic, but also by um, suboptimal policy response to it. And, you know, that that's not perfect data, but that's data you could actually, um, you know, triangulate. And, you know, as a journalist, you go out there and you ride the 35 Jane bus, which goes up, you know, and down that corridor. And you see that most of the people, while everyone else is in their bubble working from home, the people riding the bus to work in the morning or on the weekend are all racialized folks, right? And so it, again, like it's imperfect data, but when you put it all together, it kind of makes sense and it paints a very stark picture of what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tayo, any thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, I would agree with what everyone said. I think the the issues um, with the lack of, of data are, you know, as many as they are frustrating. But I also think, um, you know, we like we still need the data. And that's the that's a big part of this that I think often gets missed is like at the end of the day, we still need the information like somebody has to get it. And so in a lot of cases, like I'll just using COVID as an example, because um, Canada doesn't collect any like it doesn't collect race based data um, on any like formalized institutional level. What happened during the pandemic was that, you know, advocacy groups, um, public health units, groups like the Black Physicians of Ontario, Black Physicians of Canada, spent all of this time advocating to the government about how badly we needed this data when they could have been using that time to work with the community, work on policy solutions, like think about intervention. All of this time that could have been spent actually fixing the problem and dealing with the scale of the um, of the harm that was felt from the pandemic was then spent begging the government to like give us some kind of way to actually quantify the problem. Um, and so that I think is one of the kind of ripple effects of this data issue that I think often gets missed is just like the is the fact that some of that data we just can't do without and so you know in seeking it a lot of time then gets put um like time that could be put toward working on the problem then gets put towards like trying to ask to get the data and then we still don't we still don't end up with a resolution where they say okay this is how it's going to be going forward we still have all these piecemeal solutions so the province will give you know the some organization a little bit of money to do a study um, but that's one study right like we we will have other health um, situations that we need to deal with in the future so there still is no permanent solution and so that means like what we're looking ahead to is a future where it is going to continue to be advocacy groups and public health units and um you know uh, volunteers from the community basically lobbying the government to say we need this information um every time there's a problem yeah that's really helpful um so maybe i will ask you a follow-up question from the perspective of someone who does research on on equity issues um and encounters many of the barriers you've talked about Denise mentioned it you know academics also are constantly trying to get data from the government and and hitting roadblocks very often um the observation I have having lived in the U.S. for a long time 
um, is that there's not only more data, there's more academics producing um, studies with that data. And so I think what happens in the US often is that the media have this plethora of people to go to. Um, anytime an issue arises, there's usually a, an expert who can tell you and break down the data for you and so on and so forth and give you a good at least head start. And there's usually many. So, you know, if you look at a, a New York Times article, they've usually quoted three, five, seven, you know, academics uh, on, on a pretty small issue. And um, I'm still for myself sorting out why we don't have more quantitative expertise in social science writ large in Canada, which I think has been true uh, here. Um, but having said that, um, there are people who are now doing more equity work. I think in the race space, it's still fairly limited, especially in health, because we haven't had the data. Um, some of us have been trying to use whatever data we do have through Stats Can, But there is more work emerging now. And I wonder if you have thoughts about how uh, those of us who produce the evidence, there's a few people in the questions that have been asking, you know, hospitals often are producing information, whether it's data driven per se, but information about equity issues they're covering, um, academics are, are producing that information. What are ways that we can connect to journalists ahead of time, because I think part of the issue is in real time, we may or may not be able to connect with you uh, for a variety of reasons, including not knowing who to connect to, um, to get messages through, because we really don't have all the time in the world to just randomly be, you know, um, uh, contacting people. Of course, we do have comms people at U of T, but still there are limitations on the journalists end in terms of who's going to take up an equity issue. But I wonder if there's a sort of way that we could do um, a, a, a more proactive approach to conveying the evidence that's being produced on equity issues to the media and to journalists and editors like yourselves. And if that's even feasible or desirable, is there any way to do this that's not um, at least exclusively about real-time action and, and maintains more of a steady flow? As someone who's in both worlds, as a journalist and academic, it's not super accessible for people who do not speak the language of academia. And so there are thousands of articles about health and equity, like thousands. I have my RAs looking for them and they're finding so many. But the correlating number of articles about those findings and about um, that reference those findings is much, much more narrow. Um, I think social media is actually a great tool, like infographics or just finding a way to build a brand as someone who is known for being able to communicate that data in an accessible way on social media. So, you know, there are certain accounts that I follow on Instagram or on Twitter um, that do a good job of summarizing studies. As someone who has long COVID, I, you know, follow certain people who are very good at translating the long COVID information into something that I can quickly understand and digest. I got more useful information on Reddit about my condition than I did from any doctor or any researcher, to be perfectly honest, um, because there were people on Reddit who were extremely good at reading those papers and distilling them into something that um, you know, I am someone who can read a paper, but when you have long COVID and you can't get off of your bed, you don't actually have time to uh, read those papers and need someone who can distill that for you and say, try this or take that. Um, and I actually credit my faster recovery to some semblance of normalcy because someone was able to do that um, for me. And so finding ways to distill it, I mean, hire the young people. They know what they're doing. They know social media. They will know how to make that TikTok for you that will um, make that message go viral. So for me, harnessing the power of social media and making it easy for people to find it understand, and understand it. Those are great, great insights, great suggestions. Anyone else? Um, I would also say 
liberate the data that is held on to in academia. And I would say amen. Thank you. Right? Like open data. I mean, we do have pockets of really good race-based data, right? Like Camille Ulrich, for those who know her, you know, Black leader, head of the LIN at the time, pushed for hospitals collecting race-based data, equity data, right? So, you know, gender, sexual, like, orientation, income, race, like, it's all there, but where is that? Like, can I even, you know, use that, right? And, you know, one of the things that we learned from COVID-19 and the pandemic is, like, it's really the first pandemic in the history of the world where open data has such a big role. I mean, not only journalists, but kind of like anybody actually who could work a spreadsheet was pulling this data from various government systems and doing your own analysis and throwing it out there for the world to kind of see. Um, so I think we need to do the same with the kind of data that we have, the top to equity. And unfortunately, I think a lot of it is much more complex than the data that we saw during the pandemic, but also I think there needs to be more efforts to make that open as well for anybody to, to use and analyze. That's great. Mr. Tayo, anything else on that? Yeah, I, I was just gonna add that I think, um, yeah, the, you know, Hadia's point about just kind of making it accessible is really crucial, especially now that there's, fewer and fewer like journalists who are specialized in a thing. So like, you know, your typical like science journalists or health journalists who could have um, understood the language or who would have been kind of that conduit for like translating all of the um, kind of jargon that people, that everyday people might not understand. Um, there's fewer and fewer of those types. So you like now the the typical, like all of the studies and all of this information that's being gathered um, now has to be like, you know, accessible to like a five-year-old like me who has never heard any of these terms before, but then has to turn that into a story um, that the public can understand. So I think that's a really, um, like just making it accessible, especially because there, we just don't have enough bodies who can actually do this work and only this work um, means that it's more crucial for for that uh, work to be accessible and I think also to in a lot of ways I'm really glad that we're having this conversation because it can feel like the two worlds are siloed off right like ac academia exists on one side and then um, journalism and media lives on one side and so I think kind of finding more ways where the two work together and where the media portion of it isn't the afterthought, like building the messaging into the, the gathering and the documenting um, and like thinking about that in the process rather than like kind of figuring out how to translate it after all the work has been done, um, I think would be really helpful. Great, yeah, Denise. Um, well, I wanted to give a shout out to the University of Waterloo media team because I open all their press releases about climate and environment. So um, I'm just trying to, I'm looking at one. The It's very short, it's like less than a thousand words. The subject line tells me exactly what it's about. Um, they put the expert in there and, um, you know, help help you actually set up a time to talk with them. Um, the University of Guelph was good at that too. Last year I wrote a story about COVID-19 and animals. Um, so, you know, you should make your comms people do their jobs. <laughs> and then another thing they could do is comms training for researchers and scientists, because I find um, sometimes, you know, scientists are studying very, very specific esoteric things and that ability to pull out and talk to, you know, a normal human being um, like myself, who is like, oh, you know, that's um, very helpful. It's helpful if they have patience with us and to understand that, you know, we're asking dumb questions because those are the questions that people have. And so um, I'm not trying to like insult your expertise or, you know, make myself sound stupid, but it's just like, I need like, yeah, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old, like Tayo said, you know, because that is the amount of time that people have, you know, and I also, as much as I wish people read every single 4,000 word story that we run, I know that I have 
25 tabs of 4,000 word stories open in other publications that I'm not going to read. So like, we can't be upset or, you know, dismissive of the fact that people have very little time. Um, and the faster that we can get them important information in like the most clear, least condescending manner possible, the better it is for everyone. Because the whole point is that this is important stuff that we want everyone to know. This is super helpful um, as someone on the other end. Um, first, let me just say that I was telling someone earlier today that there was a, a Time Magazine article with uh, where they interviewed many Nobel laureates. And um, there was sort of a running theme where the laureate said, effectively, if I can't explain what I do to my grandma, then I don't actually know what it is I'm doing. That you really need to be able to, to know, like to know in the most clear, simple terms to be able to articulate that. So that's not dumb. That's not, you know, because you don't know anything. It's because actually that's the most intelligent way probably to, to convey the basic message. Um, I think there's a couple of other things happening. So, uh, you know, you mentioned that journals will come back to you um, if you've answered their call once. So I often found during the pandemic, um, journalists would come back after I had uh, uh, worked with one and ask me things I didn't feel I had expertise um, on. And so, you know, your point about um, academics working on specific things, I think is a point very well taken. And I don't think the answer is what I did, which is that's not my expertise. I can't really credibly say anything. I mean, that sometimes is true, but I wonder if part of the story is that we need to be able to, at the level of training, of education and training, be able to provide students with the ability to um, have a sort of broader perspective on what they're doing and to go from their very narrow area to be able to articulate ideas in a broader field and maybe normalize people doing that. Maybe normalize that it's not only not insulting, but it's actually really useful to have that skill. Um, and so, you know, this is this is all that to say is this is a very helpful yeah. conversation on, on many levels. Yeah. Okay, um, I am going to open the floor now to questions from the audience. And uh, I'm getting fed a bunch, which are incredibly um, useful. So let me ask you one that's probably in the era of chat GPT been on the uh, lips of, of uh, many people. It's a big issue in academia as well. And that is the um, role of AI in all of this. So um, you know, we've been having a discussion about human beings in, in uh, newsrooms and human beings in academia and how to get information, how to synthesize it, how to communicate it. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the influence of, of artificial intelligence tools um, is in media rooms as currently constituted as currently constituted and maybe what you see on the horizon maybe maybe uh I'll open the floor and see if there's anyone who wants to speak to this or wants to start Denise go ahead I mean AI has made transcribing amazing it has saved me so much time and headache transcribing so that's excellent um I think the the thing that worries me about AI and journalism is just like disinformation and misinformation. And we already have so many bad actors making lies look like journalism with the right font and headlines and things. Um, and so I think media education is just increasingly important so that people are able to tell them for themselves what is a worthwhile piece of journalism and what isn't. Um, and it's really in the best interest of some people to make sure that media literacy doesn't exist. And so that's something that I, I see myself having to, you know, push against even, you know, with my own kid and things like that. Um, so that's one thing I like and one thing I'm really afraid of. It's helpful. Others? Yeah. I would yeah. love to use AI to make it easier for me to do the things that AI can't. Um, because the complex thinking, the sitting and wrestling with something like writing a strong narrative. AI can't do that, but AI could run that pivot table for me 
in probably much less time um, than I could, or as you know, Denise alluded to, um, transcribing. So I think it has great potential to sort of free us up to do bigger picture, bigger thinking um, without having to do some of that nitty gritty. Um, I am also concerned about disinformation and misinformation. Um, as someone who is a professor, um, I'm concerned with cheating and plagiarism as well. Um, but there will be AI detectors as well that can detect, <laughs> detect the cheating. So hopefully that will take care of that problem. But um, I think the promise of technology was supposed to free us to do higher order, higher level things. Um, and maybe AI will bring that. Very helpful. Others, Tayo or Tayo? No, I, I have similar thoughts. Like I honestly, it's I'm a little bit scared, but um, just for the potential, especially on the uh, misinformation, disinformation front, like, that's the most, I think probably the most frightening for me, especially because like, I think the rise of AI tools has also kind of exposed just how low media literacy is and just how little investment there is in actually making sure that what you're reading is properly sourced and like it came from a real person and like this is correctly attributed. So I think there's, um, yeah, like AI has definitely kind of opened up like new avenues for as Sidia said, just being able to kind of put off certain tasks. Um, it's been a lifesaver for transcribing. I use Otter, pay for it every month, like this nine bucks I spend every month. But, you know, it does, it, it, it can be a bit frightening when you think about the potential for the fact that people are scrolling through Twitter and not stopping to make sure and verify something. Um, like li living in that, you know, kind of trying to grapple with information in that kind of world um, is a little bit frightening. Yeah, absolutely. Ty, anything else on your end? No, well said. Great. So uh, a, a few people in the audience are talking about how they can better serve media and connect to media from their organizations. And there are people who are based in hospitals. There are people who are based in nonprofits who are sort of asking or suggesting similar things. So I thought I'd just group it together. Um, have you had experiences with um, organizations or systems that you felt worked well? Um, it's sort of a follow-up to the earlier question uh, of how to bridge the, the connection between academics uh, uh, and journalists better. And I think, you know, I really appreciate Denise's um, shout out of a couple of schools that are doing it well because it gives us concrete examples. So one possibility is that So, sorry about that. We just seem to have some technical difficulty. Okay, so uh, why don't I uh, why don't I take over a little bit? I'll just jump in. I'll do a very poor job compared to Arjman, uh, but uh, it'll at least uh, it'll at least keep us going. Um, look, maybe uh, maybe we can come back a little bit uh, and just sort of kind of pick up the same uh, the same line of discussion. Um, as we think about what we might be able to do here, anyone want to come in with sort of some other options that we could kind of explore or pursue? I think that, uh, Denise may raise a really good point about like um, university comms. Like, I think I love a good, like well laid out, easy to read. I know what the story is right from the headline comms email because, and you just get a better response with those, right? Like it's also a two-way relationship. The university also wants their research to be put out there, right? So I think um, even on that side, like it is, um, it just makes it a lot easier for us to get through. Um, and I think, um, I don't know if, um, it was the University of Waterloo who started this, but it was, it was the first place where I saw like those expert databases where like you can literally plug in any like area of expertise and then you'll get a drop down with like 
whoever the expert is who can actually talk to an issue. Um, so this is less about um, kind of, you know, studies and, and research, but more about like finding a voice. Um, and I think if the university, and I know that there is in the States, there's like um, a cross um, institution platform that exists. So you can plug in areas of expertise and get experts from any university. I don't think that we have um, so there are some Canadians on that list, but I don't think we have a system like that here in Canada. So even if it was, you know, here and there at a few institutions, or there was some way to develop a system where you could plug that in and get experts from anywhere, I think like that is a resource that I use constantly because um, you just like all the experts are right there, but also um, you're able to be more intentional about that question of, that we discussed earlier about who gets to be the expert and who do we constantly put front and center to be the face of these issues. Mm -hmm. So you can be a little bit intentional in that way about, um, you know, picking your experts. Right. And I was crushing here, the, sorry, the earlier reference of University of Waterloo, but it's something I can take back to U of T to, uh, to pick uh -huh. up. Well, uh, I would please just one caveat for that. Um, yeah. I would like to make sure that that list is diverse and I would like to see PhD students and postdocs on there as well because I find sometimes someone who's more senior and has 30 years of experience great but they're not actually doing the on the ground work it's often the people in their lab doing it um, and you don't necessarily need the person who has 25 years experience you just really need someone who has more expertise than you the reporter a lot of the time and those people at the PhD and postdoc level are more likely to be more representative of um, our Canadian community. So making sure that um, they're also getting those opportunities um, to speak and to put that on the resume and get their name out there as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Ty. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a lot of talk about Waterloo, and I'm sure they're doing a great job. But um, <laughs> in my opinion, and I'm not just saying this, Dani, because you're now moderating, but like U of T, the science table, like absolutely killed it as far as knowledge translation is concerned during the pandemic. I mean, between you and Peter Uni and Rob Steiner and you know the whole gang, like it's just like incredible, just the pace, but also the ability to engage the media with really complex issues uh, on terms that the media and the public could understand. So I mean, kudos to to U of T and the whole gang there at the science table for doing that. And I hope there's some lessons from that experience that could be parlayed. Uh, going forward and, and maybe help other organizations that are maybe struggling a little bit more with trying to make this happen with with media outreach and, and dissemination of knowledge. Great. Well, and, you know, thank you for that. I should, I should note that, you know, that we're lucky with the science table, just kind of picking up maybe on uh, Tayo's point that it was scientists from across the province. It was one of the first times that we tried to get that sort of broader perspective. And, and we missed a lot. But, you know, I, I think there was things that, that were good to learn from that. I'm going to ask one question. I'm going to turn it over to someone uh, far more capable than me because I see Arjuman's back now. But maybe uh, Denise is one of Clearly to not, Stainy. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Denise, I think you talked about, maybe it was you talked about surfacing all the data that government kind of has uh, tucked away. And so, you know, someone in the audience has asked, working in a not-for-profit, you know, they report all their data to government. How can we create more opportunities for collaboration between us and journalists? Do you want to start on that? And if I said that it was you and I, I missed that, I'm sorry. Um, well, I think that this is relevant to like hospitals and medical researchers and all academics as well, is that, um, Institutions need to recognize that when their staff talks to journalists, that is part of their job. And it's like, you know, great outreach for the school and make them able to do that. And in terms of diversity, make different types of people able to do that. Because I've really heard so many times from women, especially um, there's imposter syndrome, with which Arjuman talked on before, which is that if it's not specifically their area of expertise, they feel like they can't speak to it. There are family responsibilities that women carry more than men. Um, there, one that I've heard that hadn't occurred to me before, which is that, you know, female academics tend to do more of the emotional labor with students who, you know, are having a hard time or need an extension or this sort of thing. And that, again, takes away from the time that they might be able to talk to a journalist. Um, so for both schools and nonprofits, I would say if you want us to consider you a reliable source for diversity and equity, make sure that we're talking to different kinds of people and make sure that those kinds of people are able to talk to us. And then for nonprofits, 
you know, your research is super helpful for us. Um, again, make sure your comms team is targeting the right journalists when they're sending it out because it is so annoying to get something that is not what I write about at all. I just got something today about like kids running shoes and I guess that's interesting to me as a parent, but like, I'm not going to write about this. It's so irritating. Why are you sending it to me? So make sure that you're, you, you know, you and your communications team are targeting the right journalists. Um, if you like someone's work and you don't have something specific to offer them right now, drop them a line so that they know that you are someone that's reading their work, that appreciates it and might in the future have some sort of expertise to offer them. That's a great way to make a relationship. Possibly you can go for a coffee outside of some sort of specific story or research. And, you know, then you'll be in someone's head next time that they're doing some sort of story. They're like, oh, yeah, here's a person that knows about that. And I know that they're willing to talk to me. That's great. Sorry, sorry, everyone. I like blinked and I was out of Zoom. So uh, here I am. Denise, can I um, ask a, or make a comment and, a, and a, ask a question? So I think some of the irritation that academics have felt is also when the this is this this is not my area why are you asking me but I think there should be a way to get over that on on our end which is maybe again social us socializing ourselves to understand that that's going to happen and people won't necessarily know um, what our expertise is because it's not clear uh, to Hadia's earlier point, if you don't speak that language, then even your bio isn't fully conveying exactly what you do. But on your, your end, what's a good way for us to know what journalists to target? I mean, so those of us who um, you know, may read an, an outlet or follow this work intently, we'll probably have some idea, but any sense of what good ways are to, to find the right journalists? Yeah, I mean, other than following the news, I'm not 100% sure. That's a good question. I guess maybe, you know, the same way that you might refer me to a colleague, I will refer people to my colleagues, right? So if someone yeah. sends me some sort of tip that doesn't work, I'll, I will point them in the right direction. So hopefully that would happen. Um, other than that, I don't really know. Maybe someone else has an idea about that. I find seeing who you like to follow and then seeing who they like to follow and retweet um, can be helpful for sort of branching through that web. That makes sense. Great. Uh, okay, so I don't know what I missed entirely. So forgive me if any of this is is a repeat. Um, so there's been a couple of questions that have to do with um, media structuring. And um, one of them actually talked about how some communities are producing their own media. And in some ways that might fill some of the vacuums we see from major outlets. And I wondered if any of you have thoughts about sort of community specific um, outlets in terms of uh, equity reporting or really any other um, sort of ways to think about what those outlets um, have been have been able to, to, to do in terms of reporting, why they exist, their, their sort of place in the media landscape. And there was one example of indigenous outlets. Sorry, I interrupted someone. Oh, no, that was me. I was just going to okay. say, yeah, I think that's a really great point to make. Like, I think um, like ethnic media, for example, there's like been a few organizations that I've seen newly come up in the last few years, which is really um, exciting and really like I'm really glad to see again, just because, and not that it's a stand in for it, but just because local news is also dying so much. I think just being able to get into a community um, is still really important. And I think thinking about it from the, um, from a larger media point of view, the experts typically go to kind of the big name um, organization. So the, whatever the Bell Medias or the like, Canadian media is three companies in a trench coat, like, and all of the, all of the, all of the experts always go to them because of course there's profile that comes with being featured at those publications. But I think from the academic side, like maybe something that would be helpful in thinking about would just be, I think 
speaking to those smaller outlets and those ethnic media outlets and like those local local news media um, is really important because A, they need that information, but also it does lend legitimacy to their reporting. Because if there's like, if I, like I'm, a, I'm an expert or I'm an academic who has like a roster of 15 interviews I have to do today, more than likely the comms person is gonna put the star, the CBC and whatever CTV at the top of that list. And then if I run out of time, I don't, I, I'm not talking to the, you know, the indigenous reporter or I'm not talking to like, you know, whatever the Tamil reporter. So I think just making it a priority to think broadly about who you give your time to um, as experts and like also for comms departments, like reaching beyond the CBCs and the CTVs and the globals um, when you're putting, sending that information out um, would be a really helpful way to kind of like, like help raise a profile of those, um, those new media groups that are doing a lot of really important work, but don't have the same, um, I think, attention and profile that the bigger media organizations do. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, another question that has come up is about uh, intersectionality. And um, the comment is that messaging on health equity in legacy media tends to be one dimensional, uh, sort of addressing one identity at a time. Um, what are your thoughts on reporting and, and messaging on intersectionality uh, in media? Again, I'll open the floor, see if anyone has any thoughts. I think in general, when you have a more representative newsroom, you're going to get more intersectional reporting because people who hold intersectional identities that is part of their core identity and something that is top of mind for them and so it'll be something that infuses and informs their reporting so one thing um i'm doing i'm starting a new research study that is looking at how um, white reporters and racialized reporters report about race differently um I think, you know, Candace Callison and Mary Lynn Young have done some really great work on the notions of objectivity. And I, I actually, my hypothesis is that we get more nuanced reporting about race from people who are racialized. Um, that it's actually those who purport to take an objective framing who are actually missing on the nuances important. And so I think the more your newsroom starts to look like the communities you're reporting about, the better and more intersectional your reporting will become. It's really helpful. Others? Yeah, I would agree with that completely. Um, also, I think there are different types of outlets too. The ones that do um, in-depth, uh, long-form type of work, I think would probably be more amenable to exploring these issues of intersectionality um, than, let's say, outlets that are more newsy in nature, you know, you only have, you know, five, 600 words to, uh, to describe what's going on. And, and so, you know, it's really difficult, I think, sometimes in that form, to be tackling these complex intersectional issues. So I think the form and, and that kind of outlet that, that is um, producing the content, I think, has a lot to do with whether or not some of these issues uh, can be talked about smartly. Helpful. Um, okay. Um, there's a couple of questions that are about people who are experts or considered to be experts during the pandemic. We've touched a little bit on this throughout the evening. Um, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about um, whether there's discussion about this that happens within newsrooms about who experts are, who they should be, and um, sort of these essentially are conversations like the one we're having tonight happening in newsrooms. So sort of how uh, alive are these issues um, behind the scenes? Um, from the locals perspective, we talk about these issues all the time, like 
you know, I think what's happened since the pandemic began is issues of equity, you know, end up um, the, being concentrated uh, within the expertise of just a few people. I think there's probably a lot of laziness in the media too, to always reaching out to the same people, talking about the same thing over and over again. And I think um, we try very hard at the local not to go after the usual suspects, but digging deeper to see who's actually done the research and, and, and can speak to this um, with much more depth than the usual suspects. So I think mainstream media is to blame a little bit too for for making it um yeah you know so skewed in terms of who gets to be the expert on on this issue yeah others one thing i'd like to see more is people going to for example more marginalized identities for things that don't have to do with their marginalized identity so go to the black person to talk about fashion, go to the black person to talk about Radiohead, go to the black person to talk about flowers, like whatever it is, but we can speak on so many more things that are not just race. Um, but too often that is all that we are called to speak upon because we are not seen as experts in other things. So I think that is one thing that could make um, a real difference. That's helpful. And Denise, you were gonna say something? Um, I think if I can say, if I can say so, I think Chatelaine, where I used to work, does such an excellent job of getting all sorts of different women to talk about different things. Um, and it's like a less specific expertise, I suppose, than what we're looking for now at the Narwhal when we're talking about climate and stuff. But I just, even now that I don't work there anymore, it like comes to my house and like, there are so many different kinds of people under this umbrella of women that are talking about food and beauty and clothing and books. And I just like, it's, yeah, it's, it's really, um, to me, an example of what can happen if there's a commitment on the level of basically every single person on the team, um, just how much things can change and how quickly and how it can be really excellent and fun journalism. Um, and then, you know, in terms of who gets to be an expert and who has time to look for different kinds of experts, I think to, to touch on a point that Ty had earlier, which is if you're in a daily newsroom and you have to turn over a story every day or every other day, you might make three calls, but if the same person calls you back every time, then they're the person that you're going to quote because your deadline is, is happening. Whereas at the Narwhal, we do very long stories. We have the time to wait until the story is ready. Um, and that has served us particularly well with getting um, like indigenous communities to call us back, especially in BC because the Narwhal started in BC five years ago. And so they've been around for five years and they have proven to indigenous people in BC that they care about telling the story properly. They care about waiting to talk to them. They care about waiting until the source, you know, trusts you to do a, an interview on the record. Um, and we've only been in Ontario for about a year and a half and we're not, so we're, starting to get our calls to Indigenous nations back. Um, and it's it takes a lot of time to get communities that have been ill-served by the media to trust you, and that's only fair. And you need to be able and willing to put the time in to talk to people off the record, to go back to the community again, to wait until they're willing to talk to you, to wait until they're willing to take a photo. And all of that takes time that daily reporters sometimes aren't given and that legacy outlets aren't always willing to spend. And so again, you know, if you are a researcher that's working on equity, I would hope that you're paying attention to who is doing the stories well and with nuance because those reporters probably deserve your callback perhaps more than the legacy outlets do. That's great. Thanks. I I've told Denise before that my mom is kind of a, a Denise Balkasun groupie. So uh, we had Chatelaine while you were there. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, so um, a couple of other questions have come up, really, really interesting ones. Um, so one question is about equity reporting from the perspective of the institutions that matter for equity, the institutions that may be causing inequities in the first place. And the question is about um, whether 
the media is at times intimidated or afraid to report on the structures that are um, the causes of inequities and um, whether this is also somewhat related to the lack of representation in newsrooms and therefore the lack of uh, sort of solidarity, if you will. Who's got a secure job and wants to speak to this? <laughs> well, I have no job, so no boss, <laughs> so I'm fine. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I think, and if I understand it, it's like the question, like, is there a fear of kind of taking on these institutions that are causing the harm? Um, and I think that's a really important question because I think in a lot of cases, there absolutely is fear um, of like having or delving into certain conversations. Um, but I also think when there's, you know, there's a difference when it's an individual reporter versus is there an interest in the publication as an institution in maybe skew, like staying away from certain topics or, you know, skewing in a certain direction on certain topics. So I think all of those kind of ideas and interests are always um, being talked about. But for me, like in my personal experience, I'm, I'm, us I'm usually working for organizations like um, I worked for five years at the CBC um, or other organizations like that whose work is in the public interest and whose job it is to ask those tough questions um, and to ask for that accountability. Um, and I think that for me is one of the most like vital and important parts of the job that we do because there does need to be, and I think it's just like, it's the most fundamental basic thing about journalism is that there needs to be somebody there to like bear witness and to call things out. Um, but I think also in the kind of political um, climate that we live in now, there's a few different interests that can often compete with that kind of, um, you know, true north of like, this is the job that we're supposed to do. So it is an interesting time, but I think ultimately like, newsrooms and for the newsrooms that are represented here today <laughs> for the most part um are you know usually are skewing more toward asking for that accountability and not asking for it demanding that accountability because we're past the point of like asking for things i think all of the kind of groups that are represented the local the narwhal like they are we're not they're, they're not in the business of like asking the questions it's like we we're demanding accountability and we want to we want to put a voice and a face behind that um and that for me is just like exciting to be in a moment where it's it is difficult to work in media but to have you know newsrooms and newsroom leaders who are committed to making sure that that accountability is at the core of everything we do that gives me hope that's really great. I, I want to hear from others. I just want to point out to Tayo's point of, about who's on this panel. That was really purposeful. Like we wanted to get people who have been doing this reporting, who have been outspoken, who have been on the mark um, before and during the pandemic and, and not have just people who um, represent major outlets. That, that That's possible too, but we really wanted to go to people who will uh, be truth tellers. Uh, others? Reporting on structural conditions. I see Denise and Ty going for their uh, mics. Go ahead, Denise, and then Ty. Um, I think when we were, earlier we were talking about how racialized reporters tend to be more junior in newsrooms. Um, and I think that when you, I, I, I know that in some legacy newsrooms in Canada, there is tension between the senior reporters that have been, especially on a political beat for a while and have access and therefore are perhaps a bit comfortable um, and less willing to challenge that access. And then younger reporters, often racialized or otherwise marginalized reporters that really want to push those institutions. Um, there, those can definitely be clashes and it can be very hard. And I think, you know, getting back to a point I made earlier about people leaving when they sort of get to that intermediate phase in their career, um, that can be very hard as a, as a younger reporter to go into something and believe that you've joined, you know, this media outlet that is here to hold power to account and then finding out that's not necessarily always true if it's not a story that three specific people really care about. 
Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Ty or Hadia? I find it easier as a freelancer to be able to do this because I'm not actually beholden to anyone. Um, and so I can pitch it and they say no, and then I move on to somebody else who might say yes or move on to the next idea. Um, but I also recognize that I am a very in a very privileged position to be able to do that, to be able to be choosy um, because I have a whole other job um, that can pay the bills. Um, and so then I can really just write about um, the things I care about, which tend to be the more challenging topics. Um, but not every freelancer has that ability or that power. Um, so trying to use that power for good. Before I get to Ty, I think Hadia makes a great point and, and it was made by Denise as well about seniority. And I think you could say the same about academics, that younger academics are in a more precarious position to be as outspoken. And I think probably what you saw in terms of the people who were most able and willing to share their expertise, um, they certainly were predominantly white men, but the reason they were predominantly white men is also because those are people who tend to be in senior positions, have a lot of job security, not worry so much about what they say and do, um, and be fairly protected. So I think there's a sort of uh, analogous system uh, in academia. Sorry, Ty, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, no, I think everything you said, I, I agree with. I think most journalists that I've encountered, um, this is why they go into journalism, right? It's to tell the truth, to uncover injustices and to hold our institutions to account, right? And so as a newsroom and as a newsroom leader, we wanna support them, right? Because we too believe in that. And I think for a lot of us, um, you know, the mission of our organization, you know, its success is dependent on, you know, um, the same the same metric, the same outcomes, right? I think there are the practical realities also. I think some institutions, especially actually public institutions, I think probably a lot easier from my experience to kind of push for accountability. I think for private institutions, I think the practical reality of, you know, potential lawsuits and libel, I think, for small outlets like us, like if we were going to put out, and during the pandemic, we did some of this, right? Like long-term care homes were doing egregious things. And, you know, the pieces that we produce had to be rock solid and had to be lawyered up the wazoo, right? And, and that's, I think, challenging to do for smaller outlets. I think, um, especially, yeah, on, on institutions that are private sector institutions as opposed to public ones where I think litigation isn't so much a factor. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I just Tayo, to add, yeah, I just wanted to add quickly, because it occurred to me as we were talking to, especially about um, when you think about seniority and just who is in the newsroom, um, I think a lot of the times to proximity to the issue um, or to the harm that's been done is also something that comes up a lot. So a lot of the times, for example, like let's say it's, you know, an, an accountability issue with an institution that has to do with harm that's been done to racialized people. Most of this, like nine times out of 10 is going to be the racialized journalist in the newsroom who puts their hand up to pitch that story. Um, and so again, this like this I think comes together with conversations that we often have about objectivity and who gets to tell what stories and who gets to you know advocate for what stories and so a lot of the times you know racialized journalists are kind of you know qualified as advocates and which you're not supposed to do so that sometimes can um can be, I think, an inhibiting factor as far as getting those stories out because in a lot of, like I've worked in large media organizations who will look at the racialized journalist who wants to cover the important story as, oh, you like you're trying to be an activist or you're trying to be an advocate. And I think 
from the thinking about it from the side of academia, I think if there was also like equal buy-in and equal commitment from the people who did the research to saying this is an important story that needs to get told, that, that would help, I think, also in the newsroom conversation, right? So then it's not just me saying that, you know, we need to have a conversation on the show about, you know, like Black people in long-term care homes. Homes. We also have information from U of T who is saying this is a real problem and they are saying that we need to have this conversation as well. So I think that's one of the other ways that we can, especially on issues that are, you know, that relate to vulnerable or marginalized communities. I think that's one of the ways that um, academics and researchers can kind of be allies in making sure that those stories get told. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. Um, okay, uh, in the closing minutes, I have one uh, final question for you guys. So we've been here um, talking, um, and the purpose was really to uh, allow a an audience that does work on social determinants of health and health equity primarily, whether that's from hospitals or nonprofits or the university. We have students, we have faculty, we have um, uh, people who work in hospitals, et cetera, in the audience tonight. Um, and yet I kind of want to know if you weren't here talking to a generally a, a public health and, and medical audience, and you were in uh, a forum of journalists talking about equity issues and maybe um, more specifically talking about what you want to see changed and how you might want to see change in the future. Um, what would you say in that environment? What would, what would you hope would be the outcome of a conversation like that um, in order to facilitate equity issues being covered better. And that could be issues around staffing, editorial support. It could be really any number of things, better access to data or, or analysts for the data. It could be really anything. But I wonder if you were to walk away from us and to go back into your media circles, what, what would you be saying to them, um, particularly about what you would like to see moving forward? Maybe I'll, I'll ask Hadia to uh, start us off. To be frank, I am tired of having to be the one to propose solutions and to ask the questions. I think that the dynamic needs to be flipped. And I think organizations need to be answering the questions about why they don't do X or why they don't do Y. So instead of me saying, you should have more racialized reporters, I want the question to be like, it's 2023. Why don't you have more racialized reporters? What, what are the barriers to hiring? Where are you losing them? Okay, you're losing them at, you know, when they've been with the organization for five years. Well, what are you doing about that, that loss in that juncture? Um, because I don't, I shouldn't have to convince someone at this point in time that A, their newsroom is not diverse, that B, it's a problem and that C, they should do something about it. So I do a lot of um, work in the corporate space with respect to DE and I, and I spend most of my time now asking people questions in my talks. I'm like, well, you know, for example, um, we've known that if you send out the exact same resume with a stereotypically black name, you know, Jamal, Lakeisha at the top, or a stereotypically white name, your Greg's or Emily's at the top, you will get 50% more callbacks for the resumes that have white names. We've known this since 2002. This is not new information. So I usually ask, okay, how many of you know about this or are not surprised by this? A lot of hands go up. And then I say, okay, keep your hands up if your organization does anything about it in the hiring process. And then most of the hands come down. And I'm like, okay, so you've you just told me that you know about this and you've acknowledged that this is a problem. This is not a surprise to you. So why don't you do anything about it? I usually get like blank silence because they're not used to people challenging them or asking them why they're not doing something. And I'm kind of tired of it shouldn't be the burden of the people who are being oppressed to ask for you to stop their oppression. 
right? So I would like to be in a room of the higher ups and say, okay, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you cover this? What, like, what are the barriers? Because there must be barriers. There must be things that they are thinking and not communicating and not saying. So what are you afraid of? What are you, what do you think will happen if you do X? Like what, what are your fears? Um, and getting people to unpack those and then address those. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Others, Ty. Yeah, I think newsroom diversity for me is, is, is a big one. Um, but I come at it not from, from this idea that you need to do it for EDI or check a box or whatever. You actually get better journalism, right? Like being able to go into the community and have trust and have context. Like the Yada Guzman example I gave before at Jane and Finch, the photojournalist. I think, I think for those reasons, like you actually become a better newsroom, a better publication with diversity. Um, I think is is the way that I tend to think about it. The other thing I think in terms of capacity building in the industry to tackle or to report on equity, I think um, data journalism is another big one for me, like having people in the newsroom who are comfortable with the data, who can work a spreadsheet, who can understand the patterns that there is a story in this data that we need to tell. I think um, I think that is another another thing um, that is important in industry and and uh, yeah, so those two things for me are, are critical. That's great. Thank you, Tayo. Um, yeah, I think uh, for me it would be editorial support. Like I think that's really important in newsrooms and outside newsrooms. So whether that's you know, support or institutional support for um, small and emerging news organizations, whether it's like ethnic media or local media, um, but also the actual journalists and reporters that are in the newsroom. So, you know, and I think that editorial support in a lot of ways underpins um, a lot of the other like foundations that will help us kind of go forward in the points that other people have made. So for example, hiring more diverse journalists, like don't just hire five black journalists and then kick them off the glass cliff or whatever it's called, like hire them and then actually invest the time in training them in supporting them. I, like I can't tell you how many people who look like me who passed through and I'm just gonna name them the CBC machine at the time that I was there and didn't last six months while I was there, didn't last a year because they literally just were, you know, pushed off the edge and then left to sink or float, right? So I think, and this is a problem, I'm not, you know, kind of trying to call out the CBC, this is a problem that happens across newsrooms, right? So it's not just about, like Ty said, checking a diversity box, but what do you do with these people when you have them in the room with you? How do you support their growth and how do you make sure that they can actually thrive in a career as journalists as opposed to, just having them be a face so you can check a box. So I think that for me, that editorial support is um, is a huge piece. That's really helpful. Thank you, uh, Denise. Uh, I think that, you know, I'm really glad that you invited Ty here and myself. You know, we both work in small, new nonprofit newsrooms. And it's been really affirming to see that the audience is there and that the support is there and that many people across Canada want a different kind of news told in a different way with different commitments. Um, so thank you for having us. And then actually for myself, I've been, um, you know, so I've been at the Narwhal for just over a year and the first year we did a lot of great stories and a lot of people read them and I'm not actually very happy with the diversity of our subjects or our sources because this is my first time being in the environmental journalism space 100% and like it's a whole new area of whiteness that I didn't realize I was going to have to like take on the same challenges. Um, so I think just the stickiness of the problem is, you know, both sometimes you know it can be it can be a bit of a downer 
but it's also heartening that, you know, we're all working towards it and it's not any one person's fault that it problem hasn't been solved yet. It's a very stubborn problem. Um, so I think both how hard people are trying and how stubborn the problem is are two things to keep in mind. Sorry. Right. <laughs> there you go. Uh, really, I was saying it's really, really helpful. Um, these have been incredible insights. I want to just leave a couple of minutes in case there's anything, any last minute thoughts anyone wants to share. Um, I really, really wanna thank all of you uh, for being with us, for being so honest, for all the work that you do uh, and have been doing. I can tell you that for those of us who work in this space, um, you are the main way that our work makes it out of academic journals. You are the main way that um, we hope there is a bridge from us to policymakers. Um, and so part of what makes tonight really important from our perspective, uh, it's not just an esoteric, let's just, you know, uh, pick another way to approach equity. It really actually is extremely central to what we do, and it should be more central to what we do um, to, to get uh, um, a good relationship going with you so that we can communicate with the public. Um, and so once again, my sincere thanks to all of you, to all the outlets and, and people that support you. Um, my thanks again to Sabina Vora Miller, to Stanie Brown, and to our team for putting this event together. Um, I just want to remind the audience uh, that the event will be posted to the Dalalana School of Public Health YouTube page following this event, and it will have closed captions. Uh, and please do stay in touch and follow the Dalalana School of Public Health, DLSPH, and IHPME uh, uh, sites on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and the DLSPH's alumni new Twitter page, at DLSPH alumni. Uh, and we look forward to being with you again soon. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. That was great. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much.